Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books Network. I'm your host, Schneer Zalman Newfield. In We Are Not One, A History of America's Fight Over Israel, published by Basic Books in 2022, Eric Alterman traces the debate over Israel from its 19th century origins to today. Eric Alterman is a CUNY Distinguished Professor of English at Brooklyn College. I'm so glad his new book has brought him to our program. Welcome. Thank you. So to get started, could you please tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to write this work? Well, believe it or not, I actually started writing this work 40 years ago. Wow. <laughs> 40, 41 years ago now that it's 2023. Um, 42, now that I think about it. Anyway, um, uh, I, I went to Israel as a college uh, sophomore. And I came back to my home university. I stopped off at the London School of Economics for a semester. But then I came back to my home university, uh, which was Cornell University. And I had uh, discovered the tradition of Jewish intellectuals that had been centered around partisan review in the 1940s and 50s, a little bit in the 30s, and, um, and, and which had been, in my view, hijacked in the 1980s by neoconservatives, beginning in the late 1970s. And, um, and most of the Jews who were writing about Jewish issues in intellectual magazines and publishing books were these very well-funded right-wing groups that were supporting the Reagan administration and the Begin administration. And I felt like they had, uh, th- that there was not, very little left of the tradition which I, I had wanted to join. So, um, I wanted to get to the bottom of this, of how it happened. And I had a really wonderful history professor named Walter Lefebvre, who died a couple of years ago. And, um, and, and, I, and we, I did with him uh, an honors thesis that asked, a question, asked questions about the origins of Jewish neoconservatism. And I posited that they came from the 67 war, when Israel went from being... Um, uh, David to Goliath in the eyes of a lot of people. And so what I did was I compared people's views of the U.S. role in Vietnam before and after the 67 war among Jewish intellectuals. And I'm such a nerd, believe it or not. I turned that in in, in uh, May of 1982. I saved my notes. So when I sat down to write this book, I, I signed the contract for it in 2015. Uh, I still had the little note cards that I had done my interviews and my research on. And then um, 10 years later, uh, I'd become a writer and I was a columnist for The Nation and a lot of other, I wrote a lot for other publications and I often wrote about Israel and American Jews and the media. And um, I started a, a doctoral dissertation on a similar topic, which was the creation of the state of Israel's effect on American liberalism. And I spent a year thinking I was going to do my dissertation on that. I just changed my mind. I'll tell you a secret about Jews. <laughs> they write too damn much. <laughs> the purpose of a dissertation, for those who don't know, there's really one purpose of it. It's not really to advance the knowledge so much in a field. It's to show that you're familiar with all of the knowledge in the field, and therefore you can teach anything. And when you begin your re- your professional research, you will know everything there is to know before you go on. And with Jews, that just can't do it. It's just you can't know everything. <laughs> so I spent a year doing that, and I said, forget about this. And I wrote a different dissertation, which became one of my books uh, about presidential lying. It was called When Presidents Lie. But I came back. I saved those notes, too. Those were easier to save because... They were on a computer. It was still DOS, but it was a computer. And um, and then when I began this book in 2015, I had that research and also all this research I had been doing for my columns and articles. And here I am. Right. Okay. Well, there's no question about it. Anyone who reads um, your book, it's very obvious that you've done a tremendous amount of research on the, the this topic and that this topic, quote unquote, is so vast. And it's very clear that you're describing the the 
uh, political, uh, military, and a sort of cultural scene in Israel. You're describing the political and uh, uh, cultural situation in America in general, as well as in the Jewish community in America in particular. And you know, there's a lot of kind of moving pieces that you describe very eloquently. So let's let's try to jump into this a bit. Um, Oh, well, this seems like a good place to start. Uh, What did the political scientist Benedict Anderson mean by the term long distance nationalism? And how does it relate to the relationship between American Jews and Israel? I was very lucky to have him as a professor uh, at Cornell. He's famous for a book called Imagined Communities about the origins of nationalism, which I recommend to everybody. And uh, I was one of my most thrilling. This is off the topic, but one of my most thrilling experience as a student ever was seeing him map out his theory on a whiteboard before he had ever written it. Um, He was explaining it to uh, a group of graduate students and faculty, and he invited me to come, and I was really happy to be there, and I still remember it very well. But anyway, to answer your question, uh, long-distance nationalism is an easy concept to imagine when you think about the Irish. Okay, so there are more Irish people in the United States than they are in Ireland because of the potato famine emptied the place out. Um, In the beginning of the 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 middle, late middle nineteenth century, early twentieth century, and um, but those people are still deeply connected to to their homeland because they left so many relatives there, and because of their traditions and their Irish Catholicism is a real thing. It's it's an ethnic um, culture. And so you completely understand why the Irish people are national. The Irish people in New York are nationalists with regard to Ireland. That's long distance nationalism. What's weird and hard to explain about American Jews is that they have long distance nationalism for a country that is not their country. They, they, they don't come from Israel. Their relatives mostly came from Europe. Some came from Arab countries, but mostly from Eastern Europe and a few from Germany. They don't speak the language. Hardly any American Jews can speak Hebrew. And and when I talk about American Jews, I'm not talking about the 10% of American Jews who are Orthodox Jews because they're in a separate category on most of the things I'm talking about. And, and most have never been there. So they're long. So they have this nationalism for a country whose language they don't speak, that they never lived in, that they're maybe they have some relatives there, maybe not, but they don't speak the language. There's nothing like this anywhere else, and yet their nationalism is is politically speaking the most intense of any country's nationalism. Right, right, and right. So to to set the stage a little bit for for listeners who are not familiar with this whole topic. Uh, when did the modern day Zionist political movement begin and under what circumstances? Well, there have always been Jews uh, in the land of, in the Holy Land. Um, and then these Jews who, who lived there, they were extremely religious Jews who were waiting for the Messiah to come. And they needed, they felt like they needed to be a, a remnant of Jews there. And they, uh, and they didn't, they didn't do much of anything. They lived on charity, and they didn't want to do much of anything because their job was just to be there. In other words, it was up to God to bring the Messiah, and it, there wasn't anything that humans could do except be good Jews. Um, the modern Zionist movement begins with Theodor Herzl's um, pamphlet. Um, it's usually translated as the Jewish state. It's not a perfect translation, but that's what people call it, where he's where he said that uh, he wasn't religious at all. Um, uh, his, his son converted. I don't think he was I don't think he was bar mitzvah, but as a political matter, uh, particularly after he visited France during the Dreyfus affair, um, do you want to explain the Dreyfus affair? Very briefly, just what decade we're talking about. Uh, the Dreyfus Affair, I think it, was, it went on for six years, but I think it was in the 1890s where France um, France court-martialed Captain Dreyfus, accusing him of treason when he was framed. And it was really very anti-Semitically 
uh, the arguments were about Jews and their ability to be loyal to the state. Um, and so, uh, so, so it's Herzl, who was a, a very well respected journalist, uh, went back home and wrote this uh, pamphlet, The Jewish State. And then the first Zionist Congress took place in Basel, Switzerland, I believe it was 1897. Might be 1896, but I think 1897. And Herzl turned out to be this fantastic politician who went all around the world getting support for this idea that there should be a place that Jews could have as their own. Now, Herzl, again, he was not religious. He would have been okay with um, Kenya, which is what he originally thought might work. Um, it was even, there was even talk uh, of Alaska, like that. Uh, someone, Michael Chabon, I think, wrote a good novel about that having happened. Um, but it turned out that among Jews, it had to be in the Holy Land. That was the only place that they would support it. So he switched to support that. And he gained a lot of support for it from European Jews. In the United States, he got no support at all for Jew, from Jews. He got support from Christians. Um, Christians then, as today, m- many evangelical Christians and other conservative Christians see the book of Revelations as a recipe for the return of Jesus to earth, where all the Jews will be swept up and sent to hell because they have not been born again like the Christians. Um, But in the meantime, they support the uh, return of Jews to Zion, the land of Zion, because they, they understand that that's part of the God's plan to, for Armageddon that will um, bring into, into being the, the predictions of the book of Revelations and create heaven on earth. So the conservative Christians are now the biggest supporters of the government and state of Israel in the world, along with um, Orthodox Jews, but not American, not, not more secular Jews. So uh, the Republican Party... Uh, its base is in these conservative Christians. And that's why the Republican Party, that and the fact that uh, some right-wing funders give a lot of money to Republican candidates, um, that's why the Republican Party is 100% supportive of the Israeli government, whereas the Democratic Party is actually, it's also very supportive of the Israeli government, but its voters are now more supportive of the Palestinians than they are of the Israelis, um, which is a big change that's happened over time. It's brand new. Sure. To go to to go back a little bit with or to stay a little bit with the history. So, you write about how Louis Brandeis um, had a big impact on um, American Jewish thinking about Zionism. And so, could you tell us very briefly who was Louis Brandeis and how did he associate Zionism with American patriotism? Well, Louis Brandeis was sort of the perfect American Jew. The, the first group of Jews that came to America were German Jews who came in the middle of the 19th century. And they were very, uh, um, they came with their own money and businesses and, co- and connections. And they were not at all like typical immigrants. They, they, they came as middle class citizens. And they also were all, virtually all reformed Jews. So they didn't look any different than any American Jews. They even considered changing the day of the Sabbath to Sunday to fit in more. And they were they were sort of what's called a model minority. And they and they said uh, and they didn't complain about discrimination. They were so happy to be in a country that allowed them to be whatever they wanted to be, legally speaking, anyway. That they said we're just going to behave really well and show you Protestants. Catholics were not important politically then. That, that you can trust us and, and, um, and then you'll accept us. And it, and it, and it worked gradually. So uh, Louis Brandeis was appointed to the Supreme Court by Franklin Roosevelt. And this is an enormous achievement. By Woodrow Wilson. By Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and this was an enormous achievement for American Jews. It wasn't until Franklin Roosevelt that you got Jews in the presidential cabinet. But... Um, so Brandeis was also a hero. Now, at the same time, a- after the uh, German Jews got here, they were overwhelmed enormously in number by the Jews coming from what was called the Pale of Settlement, which are also sometimes just for shorthand we call Russian Jews. Um, and these were Jews from Ukraine and Poland and Russia and 
other little countries out there um, who were experiencing horrible um, uh, oppression, pogroms, and um, and also many of them were involved in revolutionary movements because they 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 needed some uh, some way to 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 oppose the the czarist oppression that they were experiencing, and there was no democracy in those places. So beginning in 1880 and running through 1924, when the United States shut down immigration, about 2 million of these Jews came over. There had been about a quarter of a million German Jews, and then 2 million Russian Jews came over. And they were very different than the German Jews. They didn't have money. They were very poor. Some of them kept to the old religion. Some of them were revolutionaries. They elected in the Lower East Side, which at the time is the most crowded place on the face of the earth. Um, they elected a socialist congressman, America's first. Um, and and Brandeis was a hero to them because he, he, as a lawyer, he was called the people's lawyer and he defended their labor rights. Um, and that improved their, their cause a lot because they were almost all union members wanted to be anyway so the people's lawyer who was respected by the germans for getting on the supreme court and being a great lawyer and beloved by the uh east european jews he got convinced that uh now the, the german jews were really anti-zionist um because they thought that number one that judaism was a religion and not a not a there's no such thing as jewish people they were just people in different countries who believed in the Jewish religion. So they insisted they were just as American as the Christians. They just happened to have different uh, religious views and mores. And they were afraid that if uh, the Jews were seen as a people who deserve their own homeland, uh, then uh, the Christians would question their loyalty and their patriotism. So they hated it. They, they Over and over, the leading uh, Reformed Jewish rabbis said, America is our Zion. So um, Brandeis came up with this idea, and it's actually stuck, where he said, look, America, we don't need Zionism. We're totally cool here. Everything's great. It's wonderful. But other countries, those Jews do, because they're getting persecuted. So our version of Zionism is going to help support other Jews go to Palestine and create their own, not necessarily a state, but back then it was their, just their own uh, political authority so that they can live freely without having to worry about being oppressed or discriminated against. That's why the, the chapter that I wrote about it, that is called Zionism for thee, but not for me. And, and that's actually been the formula. When, when Israel was founded in 1948, the uh, Israeli Jews uh, were like, American Jews, come on over. Everything's cool here. We're ready for you. And very, very few went. 5% went. Whereas in other places, a lot of the Jews just emptied out and all went to Israel. Right. So he made essentially this powerful argument that being a quote-unquote Zionist in America had nothing to do with American Jews moving to Israel or even, or you know Palestine or even contemplating doing so. It was more about helping our distressed brethren and in other countries so that they could go to they could go to Palestine and that this didn't create any kind of quote unquote dual loyalty where Jews would support American Jews would support the American government but somehow also be beholden to another government or another entity in Palestine. Right. His his slogan was that Zionism was a form of American patriotism for Jews. Right, right. Fascinating. Um, all right, moving ahead a little bit historically, uh, during the Holocaust, to what extent were American Zionist organizations focused on saving Jews in Europe versus promoting Jewish political independence in Palestine? Well, this is one of the most controversial things in the book. And right-wing reviewers who don't want to like my book make accusations about how I've written about this. I tried to be as sensitive as I could to it. But the fact is, is that the Zionists saw... <laughs> There's a few problems with Zionism from the standpoint of if you live in the diaspora. One is is that 
and it, it gets at this issue. Zionism has basically contempt for diaspora Jews. They, they, they hold them in, in significant measure responsible for their own persecution because they didn't fight back and they didn't assert themselves. And they don't like the, the image of the Jew in the diaspora. And they wanted to create a new Jew, a Jew who lives in the image of the, the Israeli Jew who works with his hands or his, her hands in the fields and makes the desert blooms and fights their own wars and speaks Hebrew. The Israelis, you know, they, they rejuvenated Hebrew rather than Yiddish. Yiddish is a language of, of, um, of uh, shame to some degree. And, um, and there was a conflict in terms of resources of how, uh, during the Holocaust of should you try and save as many Jews from Hitler's crematoria or should you try and upbuild the Zionists who were fighting to create uh, a new homeland for the Jews, the first one in 2000 years. And um, the fact is that there wasn't really much anyone could do for the Jews in Europe to save them outside of Europe. Um, Hitler didn't care what American Jews thought, and there was no support at all for allowing these Jews to come to the United States. And, and that was in part, there were two reasons for that. One is, uh, well, it was a very anti-immigrant country at the time, but there was a terrible fear on the part of the Roosevelt administration that the war would be perceived as a war on behalf of the Jews, which would make it lose support. Uh, there was a lot of anti-Semitism going into World War II. Like it was about half of American Jews thought that thought that Hitler had a re had a good reason to hate the Jews, not necessarily to kill them, but to hate. Them. Not American Jews. You mean Americans in general? Americans. Yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and and American Jews were remained terrified of the kind of anti-Semitism that had accompanied them everywhere, except in America. So they didn't want to ask for the American Jews to be allowed either. And they were also worried about um, American Jews, about, about the war being perceived for, for to save the Jews. So on the one hand, they had these horrible, horrible situations. They knew about it, but they didn't know that much about it because the newspapers didn't cover it. The New York Times buried the story. Um, but also they couldn't bear it. They couldn't bear to hear it. Uh, and then they had this thrilling, exciting new chapter that was like rewriting the Bible and creating a whole new history for the American Jews. Now, the Zionists were against helping uh, the refugees. They, because they, the only place the refugees could go would be to try and sneak them into Palestine. And if the United States was going to help with that. They were helping refugees. And the Zionists insisted, no, they're not refugees. We're not refugees. This is our land. You can't call it refugees. And they didn't, they didn't like the laws. There were, and there were fights among uh, different Jewish organizations. Some did want to just do nothing but help the Jews in Europe. And the Zionist organizations attacked them and were very vicious about them. There's a really, there was enormous fights within the Zionist movement and the American Jewish organizations over this. But basically, the American Jews decided to go with the Zionists. And begin, before World War II, most American Jews were, were, were you know, they, they couldn't make up their mind about Zionism. But by the end of the war, the Zionists had taken over all but one of the most important American Jewish organizations. And when they voted on it, um, at a conference, the, the American Jewish Congress, which was a German Jewish organization of all the muckety mucks uh, that had been sort of the ambassadors of American Jewry to the country, they were roundly defeated. And, and, the, and American Jews were totally um, on board with Zionism. All right. And uh, President Harry Truman famously recognized the state of Israel shortly after the first prime minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, declared Israel's independence on May 14th, 1948. Why did Truman recognize Israel? He, did, right. he recognized it 11 minutes after Ben-Gurion declared it. <clears throat> Very importantly, he did it for a few reasons. Um. One, he did it because politically speaking, he, he, he wanted to run for re-election. 
He needed to win New York and other big cities where the Jews were located, and they were really strongly for it. Um, there were no Arabs to, to speak of uh, in America uh, that he needed to worry about as a vote. Second reason he did it, and, and, and the interesting thing, the reason that it's interesting, the reason that there's controversy that that's because all of his foreign policy advisors didn't want him to do it. They thought it was a bad idea to create a state, a Jewish state in the midst of all these Arab states where oil was important, where the Russians were interested in being there. And, um, and also Jews had a reputation of being communists or socialists or sympathetic to the Soviet Union. But Truman was genuinely moved by the plight of the refugees who had no place to go after the Holocaust. There were still 250,000 Jews living basically in concentration camps in terrible conditions. They weren't being gassed or murdered or anything, but, but they, they, it was a, a barely livable conditions. I would say there were conditions comparable to the way Palestinians live in refugee camps today. Um, and Truman was really moved by their plight. And if, if the British had allowed immigration of those Jews into Palestine, there would have been no Israel. Because um, that's really what Truman cared about, uh, giving those, giving, getting those people you know, off the ledger so that they could go on with their lives. Uh, but the British would not agree to that because the British were beholden to the um, Palestinian Arabs. In that, in that sense, anyway. And um, the British had a mandate where, but given to them by the UN where they were in control of Palestine. Um, Since after World War One, Right. Uh, so, um, and the third reason was that the United, the United Nations had voted to create the State of Israel in 1947. And, um, and Truman really wanted, and Americans really wanted the UN to work so that the United States would not have to go around the world intervening in wars as it had now done twice. So, uh, and then there's a fourth reason which doesn't get talked about much, which is that the, the Yeshuv, which is what we call the Jewish community in Palestine, the pre-state Israel, they had actually created in this period all of the, most of the institutions one needs to, um, to uh, create a state. And their, their army had been fighting against the Palestinian Arabs during this period since the, man, since the British said that they were leaving. And they had expelled a lot of the Arabs. Um, the the, 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 the uh, IDF took credit in a document I found for expelling... The Israel uh, Defense Forces. Israel Defense Forces for expelling 700,000 Arabs before 19, by 1948. So, um, so the only government institutions in that state were the Israeli government institutions. There was, otherwise it would be chaos. Um, so there was a big risk that the Jews, they felt that there was a big risk that the Jews would be defeated and slaughtered again when five Arab armies intervened uh, to try and strangle the state in its cradle. But actually, people who really knew the situation knew that the Israelis were much stronger than they looked and the Arab armies much less organized and were probably not going to win. So it was a gamble, but it wasn't the gamble that people think it was. And, and that's how Truman made his decision. Right. Right. And, um, um, you talk about Leon Uris's uh, 1958 novel Exodus and Otto Preminger's 1960 movie version of the of the book, um, and I'm curious what significance did this book and uh, film have for American Jewish attitudes regarding the Israeli Palestinian conflict? Yeah, well, I would say not just American Jewish attitudes, American attitudes. It's one of the best selling books of all time, and movies too. Um, it's a terrible book. It's really fascinating. Uh, no one can will defend this book on literary merit. Uh, it's it's like a it's like a Hollywood western transformed into the Middle East with black hats and white hats. The Jews are the white hats. The Arabs are the black hats. The movie even puts Nazis in the in the Palestinian camp. Um, 
But the, the hero of the book is played by Paul Newman, a beautiful man. He's actually a friend of mine, had a Jewish father. Um, and, uh, and the Jews are the heroes of this book. And, and then there are, these, there are these new Jews who I've been talking about, who, who farm in the morning and make love in the afternoon and win wars in the evening, and then write poetry right before they go to bed, get up and do it again the next day. And, and it was thrilling to, um, to Americans, but particularly to American Jews who, who looked around and saw themselves as accountants and lawyers and doctors and teachers and dentists, you know, and, and uh, to, see, well, to see themselves as heroes, to see Jews as heroes. And, and Luris, he was crazy. He said, I'm going to write a new chapter of the Bible. Oh, and, my God. And, and actually, he kind of did. Like, again, when I was growing up, I'm the perfect age for this. When I was growing up, every single suburban family in my town had that book on their show. You could see it blue and white. I could even picture it. I gave a, I get, I, I, when I was in fifth grade, I gave a report to the parents of my class about the book that I had read in fifth grade, and, you know, and, uh, and, and for decades of summer camp on when it rained, the Jewish summer camp, they would show the movie and, and, it, and the Exodus version of, of, uh, the creation of the state of Israel, where the Jews reached out to the Arabs and said, please stay. We want to live in peace with you. We'll all be equal. And, um, and there was no Nakba and, uh, and the Arabs were just really slimy, uh, disgusting people who didn't didn't have the sense to see how lucky they were to have the Jews there. That was the image of Israel that became the image, the the myth for Americans. Interestingly, one thing that we haven't mentioned is that after the Americans were American Jews were incredibly excited about the creation of the state of Israel, and they created what I think is the largest lobbying campaign in all of history. But after that, they kind of forgot about it and they went back to living their lives and they worried about American issues. With Exodus in 1960 and in the 1967 war, the whole thing was flipped and, uh, and, and Israel became the most important part of American Jewish identity, again, outside of the ultra-Orthodox community uh, and it has stayed that way and, until maybe today or roughly today. But... So Go ahead. Sp speaking of which, I'm curious, how did the June 1967, quote, six-day war um, in Israel transform the American debate over Israel? There was enormous fear when the uh, Gabdal, uh, Colonel Nasser of Egypt united Egypt and Syria as one country. And uh, the Jordanian... Who, who were pretty friendly to Israel, actually, behind the scenes, <clears throat> they had to go along with Nasser because otherwise the king of Jordan, King Hussein, would have been overthrown because of the movement in the Arab world towards Arab nationalism, of which Nasser was the leader. <clears throat> so Nasser shut down the Suez Canal through which Israeli shipping, Israeli shipping went and made a lot of um, extremely hostile comments about Israel <clears throat> that led to believe led people to believe that he was going to destroy Israel and kill the Jews. The famous comment that he was going to drive the Jews into the sea, he probably never said. That's probably apocryphal. But he said other things, and a lot of other people said other things. And all of a sudden, American Jews were feeling like, oh my God, there's going to be another Holocaust. We're powerless again. I can't believe this, we're going to let this happen a second time. And, and they were so nervous. But again, they, the United States was mixed up in Vietnam. People were learning that uh, they had been lied to. There was no support for anybody for the United States to get into another war to defend Israel. So there was this horrific moment among American Jews. And then Israel, like a miracle, in six days. Destroys the Israeli, destroys the Egyptian air force in a preemptive attack. Wins the war. You know, writes poetry at night, um, and uh, and it's just the most thrilling thing imaginable for the dentists and the doctors and the accountants and the lawyers. Um, 
And, uh, and from then on, all the Jewish organizations, just virtually all of them, and individual Jews and synagogues all decided that being a Jew in America meant to support Israel. And part of the support for Israel meant to, was to recall the Holocaust. So there was very little discussion of the Holocaust and not that much discussion of Israel before 1967. And then like overnight, everything changed. Like if you look at the uh, good examples, you look at the report of 1966 for the American Jewish Committee. They don't get to Israel to page um, uh, 35. (laughs) And then the next year, it's all Israel. And the budgets, you know, go to Israel. And they created this enormous structure that allowed them to just jump in whenever there was any kind of controversy to take Israel's side. And that was how they manifested their Jewishness. That was how, I, how my parents manifested their, their Jewishness. It's how I was taught in Hebrew school to manifest my Jewishness. I didn't learn anything about Jewish history or Jewish culture. I learned to, to argue with people who criticize Israel and bring up the Holocaust when they did. To bring up the Holocaust as a way to justify support for whatever Israel was doing. So maybe Israel is committing uh, uh, crimes. Maybe they're violating Palestinian human rights. Well, we suffered from the Holocaust, and therefore, you know, we're we're justified in doing. Yeah, and, 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 and I quote Eli Wiesel in the book and say, and Menachem Begin both saying the same thing. The world, the Christian world, has no right to lecture us about morale. Right. We, don't, we don't want to hear it. Right. So it gave it gave Israel a, like a bulletproof uh, vest against any political Get attack. Get out of jail card. Uh, say whatever we're doing, you know, who right. are you? We have license, the moral high license ground. License to kill. All right, all right, all right. I see. Um, uh, so, how did Israel's victory in the 1967 war change political attachments to it from a cause on the left to a cause on the right? Uh. Good question. Um, well, uh, on the new in the new left, the far left, um, the Palestinians who who the Palestinians were never really people didn't think of them as Palestinians. It's I, I'm not clear on exactly when this happened, but they became a, a third world cause, like the Vietnamese and the Algerians and. Um, other groups that were fighting against imperialism. And the Israelis were identified as imperialists on working with the West, the United States. The Soviet Union had supported the creation of the State of Israel uh, in order to get the British out of the Middle East and then turned anti-Israel not that long after it. And Israel had had good relations with African, emerging African nations. They were very um, proud of that, but uh, Basically, the third world movement embraced the Palestinian cause. And Israel went, again, from being perceived as David to being perceived as Goliath. The aggressor. Yeah. And second, the United States was leading an imperialist war, as everyone understood it, in Vietnam. Particularly when Nixon became president, the Republicans, Henry Kissinger. Um, and, and so the United States became the bad guys. And if you were allied with the bad guys on the left, then you were bad guys. So Israel on the far left, this isn't, didn't have too much to do with Democratic Party politics yet, but it, it had to do with like college demonstrations and, and UN uh, meetings. Um, and uh, what, what changed, I think, for Israel over time, two things I think are key here. One was the election of Menachem Begin in 1977 when the socialist, heroic first generation of Israelis, the farmers and the poets and the novelists, were overthrown by the old-fashioned Jews who had no use for any of that stuff and did not appeal on this level, this romantic level, to American Jews. And then second... um, Israeli invasion of Lebanon, 1982. Um, It it was seen as an aggressive war by most people. It was an aggressive war. Um, And uh, 
And it was, it, Israel has this doctrine of asymmetrical um, response to terrorism. So they, they, they think that in order to um, uh, prevent terrorism in the future, they have to kill a lot more people than the terrorists have killed and, and blow up the houses of their families, do all kinds of things that are, are not really permitted under uh, international law, but they don't care about that. So, so this was kind of a, an explosion of that doctrine where they, uh, Begin uh, decided he was going to go into Lebanon and um, really it was masterminded by Ariel Sharon. They were going to wipe out the PLO from all of Lebanon. The Palestinian Liberation Organization. Right, which had, set, up, had set up a mini state in Lebanon run by the PLO. Um, the Lebanese government couldn't do anything about it. And, uh, and, and, and the Israelis liked the Lebanese government, which, were, which was a Christian right-wing government at the time. So they were going to go in and kind of create this whole new situation, wipe out the PLO, turn the Christian government, the Lebanese government into a government that could make peace with Israel. And um, it turned out that this was a lot harder than it looked and that Sharon probably lied to Begin and therefore Begin misled the United States about what they were going to do. And, um, but what really happened, most importantly, was that <clears throat> Israel, the Israelis attacked a modern city, Beirut. They kept it under siege and they bombed it relentlessly. And the international media lived in Beirut because um, it was a great place. It was the Paris of the Middle East. And you could get anywhere from there. You know, they had a great airport and um, it was in the middle of everything. And you didn't want to necessarily live in Israel because that would make it hard to report on Arab countries. And so all these journalists were seeing this Israel that was nothing like the mythical Israel that had been created, that was not so nice and sweet. They were killing civilians. Then you had this horrific uh, massacre in inside these two refugee camps called Sabra and Shatila, where the Israelis, knowing what was going to happen, surrounded the refugee camps and allowed the uh, militias from the Lebanese Christians to massacre hundreds and hundreds of Palestinian women and children. It was mostly women and children because the fighters were out there fighting. So um, this eventually uh, brought down the Israeli government and there were investigations and it created a crisis of conscience uh, within Israel, um, something that you're not seeing today when, uh, well, no, that's not fair. But it created it, 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 it created a crisis of conscience within Israel and massive protests in the beginning of the Peace Now movement, um, but also the very first divisions among American Jews saying, well, I, I love Israel, but I can't support this. It's the first time they said, I have a difference with the actions of the Israeli government. Right. And, then, and then the first intifada, which followed, played a similar role in two ways. The first intifada was in 1980. 788, I think. So this is a political uprising on the, on behalf of Palestinians in Israel. Yes, and and the West Bank, and um, and this was something new, because the PLO was always very unpopular in the United States because it was committing acts of terrorism against Jews all over the world, and and Americans identified with these Jews, and you know they would take they would they would hijack a plane and take the Jews off the plane and and let everybody else go and sometimes kill the Jews, sometimes negotiate, but there was very little sympathy for the PLO, except among the furthest right, uh, left wing of um, groups. But, um, but in, 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 in 82, Israel began to lose support of liberals. And in 87, 88, with the Intifada, you had these teenage kids resisting Israeli uh, rule against the Israeli army. And Yitzhak Rabin, the Israeli defense minister said to the IDF, go in and break their bones. He, he was advised by Henry Kissinger, said, you need to act like South Africa does in this and destroy it right away. Um, so that's what they did. They just, the kids were throwing rocks at the tanks and the Israeli soldiers were going around and breaking teenage bones. And then the American journalists would go into the hospital and they'd be interviewing these kids who were in traction, you know, and they would be 14 years old. And it wasn't PLO and Arafat. It was kids who said, we can't live like this. And, and, it, and in addition to that, there was an emergence, and this is in part due to the television show Nightline, which spent a week in Israel, in West Bank, 
um, on ABC News. It was then the most important influential television news show there was. Ted Koppel was the host. And he, he reported on it for a week. And then he had a town hall with Israelis and Palestinians. They were separated by a wall in the, in the studio because the Palestinian representative said, we're not here to represent the PLO. The PLO is in Tunis. You need to talk to them. But we're here to tell our story. But it was absolutely crucial because you had uh, people like Dr. Hanan Ashwari and uh, Saeed Erekat, uh, a lawyer and other really upper middle class, well-spoken Palestinians who didn't look like Yasser Arafat. They looked like people who could be living in your neighborhood or could be your doctors or your professors or your lawyers. And they were saying, you know, you're asking us to live like this. We can't live like this. We're not, we're not terrorists. We're, we just want to live normal lives. And from then on, you had a Palestinian side and, a, and an American side in the argument in the United States. Congress was still dominated by Israel. But in terms of the discussion on campus, in op-ed pages, it was no longer 100% one-sided as it had been. Right. And... Um... Uh, what was the impetus for the creation of APAC and uh, the American uh, Israel Public Affairs Committee? Well, APAC was created in the 1950s. <clears throat> there had been an Israeli massacre of uh, in the West Bank, I think it was, um, or maybe uh, I forget the name of the town. And Israel got some bad publicity. And previously, the Israelis had had their own organizations that they lobbied Congress with. But uh, that was a violation of the Foreign Registration Acts, where you need to register if you're a foreign agent. So they created APAC. They took the organization they had and turned it into an American organization, and they were American people doing it. (coughs) And originally... <clears throat> Excuse me. Originally, APAC was a quiet little organization that tried to talk to congressmen to be to give Israel benefits with loans um, from Congress, and um, eventually to help Israel get arms. Israel didn't get any. The United States didn't sell any arms to Israel until the Kennedy president. See, um, but they also set up this other side of them to for purposes of propaganda, as they called it, because they were getting bad publicity from this incident that I can't quite remember in my head right now. Um, And and, and that part of APAC, so APAC is really, APAC became three things over time. And I should say it expanded enormously under its third director, whose name is Thomas Dine, uh, in the 1980s under the presidency of Ronald Reagan. So originally, again, it was a it was a sort of low key organization that talked to senators, it particularly talked to Jewish um, staffers, uh, which they which Israel saw as a as a secret weapon to try and get Congress to be more friendly to Israel. Although it was quite friendly to Israel even before that. Um, but in the nineteen eighties, APEC expanded into a grassroots organization where they created chapters all over the country, even in places where they had hardly any Jews. And what they did was they they they, cho- they helped to choose congressional candidates. They helped to fund their races. They helped to defeat people that they thought were not sympathetic to Israel. They helped to get jobs for people in Congress, in the Defense Department, in the State Department, in the think tanks for people who were thought to be um, sympathetic to Israel and to try and blackball people who didn't. And they also tried um, to fight the battle in the press. So anytime Israel got any bad press, they would call the reporter uh, uh, names and and try to discredit them. And uh, they were joined by, again, in the 1980s, neoconservative pundits like Norman Perharitz of the um, commentary magazine funded by the American Jewish Committee, Martin Peretz, who owned the New Republic, uh, Abe, Abe Rosenthal, the former editor in chief of the New York Times, and these people would attack the characters of anyone who criticized Israel. So, if you wrote negatively about Israel or even sympathetically about the Palestinians, you were kind of making a career decision that could very well cost you your future. Right, and the great, the uh, great 
the great power of APAC, I quote um, various people in power saying, is what never happens, what you never hear about, because it's just not worth taking on APAC. Right. Um, uh, speaking of which, uh, in 2007, John Mersheimer and uh, Stephen Walt published their controversial book, The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy. What was the book's central thesis? Well, the, the, the reason that book was important is because most of the attacks on Israel and the Israel lobby until that book had been by left-wingers who were not considered respectful or people associated with the Palestinian cause. Edward Said had been the most famous uh, literature professor at Columbia, a uh, very respected literary critic, but also very left-wing. He wrote in The Nation um, and the London Review of Books. Noam Chomsky, Said and Chomsky, ironically, are probably the two most famous intellectuals in the world at the time. Um, but again, Chomsky was a left-winger uh, and, and wasn't taken seriously by the establishment. So Walt and Mearsheimer came from the very center of the respected academic establishment, one from Harvard, one from the University of Chicago. Both had lots of awards. Both were not radicals. They didn't write in The Nation or The Village Voice. They wrote in foreign affairs and foreign policy and international security. And they wrote an incredibly harsh attack on the Israel, what they call the Israel lobby for its perversion of U.S. foreign policy and its, uh, and its pushing the United States into, it wasn't a moralistic argument. <clears throat> it was an argument that we were hurting our own interests. And in fact, it was our support for Israel that had caused the ruinous invasion of Iraq, which as we speak, is we're experiencing its 20th anniversary of the worst strategic disaster in American history. Um, so my argument about their argument in the book is that uh, they overstated their case. They don't have evidence that Israel is responsible for Iraq. We would have had Iraq without Israel, I would argue. Um, they went too far. Uh, they're unfair in certain places. They didn't really understand the American Jewish community all that well. But there is definitely an argument to be made. Um, Barack Obama, I would say, conducted his presidency as if their argument were largely true, that you don't take on the Israel lobby uh, if, except for a very, very good reason. And if you do, you are going to pay a very high price for it. That is not the case with any other foreign policy issue. Um, the story I tell about in the beginning of Obama that, uh, that he tells in his memoir, um, where he sent his aide, his deputy national security advisor, Ben, um, I think I always forget his name. It's a good writer. Anyway, he sent his deputy national security advisor. He, he wanted Israel to freeze its settlement building, Obama did, at the beginning of his term, to restart the peace process. Um, and, and so he needed support for that. So he sent it to a congressman, a Democratic liberal congressman, to get him to come out in favor of it. And the, guy, and, and the advisor came back and said... It's not happening. And Obama says, I don't understand. Isn't he? I, I know this guy's against the settlements. And he says, yeah, he is against the settlements. He's just much more against doing anything about the settlements. And that's because of the power of APAC, the most powerful foreign policy lobby in American history, a lobby that uh, for a long time was understood to represent American Jews, but actually does not represent American Jews. It represents... Its views are much closer to those of conservative Christians than American Jews. And, uh, and, and at, at most, you could say in the past, it represented about half of American Jews, the, the hard line half. But there's two problems with that, with saying that uh, today, or, and they have said, they've been true for a long time. One is, is that American Jews do not consider Israel to be the most important political issue for themselves. And again, I'm not talking about the ultra-Orthodox. Um, only 4% of American Jews say that Israel is their number one issue and that, and those people are divided. And secondly, the American Jews do care about Israel, maybe not first or second, they care about it, but more American Jews are dovish on Israel than they are hawkish. Um, so, uh, so APAC, which is 100% hawkish and always supports the Israeli government and, 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 and doesn't really care about the issues that American Jews care about, in the 2022 election, endorsed 108 
insurrectionist Republicans, um, something that American Jews are totally opposed to, the vast majority, um, has, has become an organization that supports the Israeli government, as long as the Israeli government is a right-wing government, um, not an organization of American Jews. And, and, and things like this, uh, and organizations like J Street and Trua, an organization I sometimes work with, and uh, Amenu, there's all these organizations that represent American Jews who care deeply about Israel, but oppose everything that, who, who say, we care about Israel, we oppose the Israeli government, and that's a function of our Abu Hat is Israel, our love for Israel. Uh, the, the Walt Mearsheimer book has no place for them, really. They don't, they don't really exist uh, in that universe. So that's, those are my criticisms of the book. So I, I, I think I would say I, I agree with about 50% of it. But these authors were so pilloried, they were so attacked, their names were so run through the mud that um, you wouldn't believe it. You would think that they were, uh, they were no, in the New Republic, they, so this is like David Duke wrote this book. The, the um, KKK leader. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, that happens. I, I, I was just reviewed in a, in a publication called The Jewish Review of Books by a right winger who compared me to a writer named Max Blumenthal, someone who supports Putin and Assad and is a well-known anti-vaxxer and who hates Israel more than he hates anything in the entire world. But because I wrote a history, and I think my book is, it, it, it doesn't really take a position in most things. It says, here's what happened. It's just a lot of unpleasant things happen. Um, this was an example of what has been happening to anyone who criticized Israel for a long time. Uh, commentary did the same thing. Commentary wrote a review where they said I was uh, an anti-Zionist. I'm not an anti-Zionist. I've never, I've always said I'm not an anti-Zionist. Um, I think there should be a state of Israel. Hence, I'm not an anti-Zionist. Uh, so so this, this lives on, and this is a legacy of the world that APAC helps create. Right, right. Well, there's so much um, that that you cover in your book, and even just in our time together, there's so many topics that we've touched on. But we we are coming to the end of our of our time together today. So, as a last question, I'm wondering what do you hope readers take away from your book? Well, I've often said about this book that I don't expect anyone to agree with me completely. Um. It's very critical of Israel. It's also very critical to Palestinians. I think the Palestinians have been terrible at politics, unrealistic, and they should have made a lot of deals beginning with 1947, where they refused to cooperate with the UN. Uh, and they should have accepted a lot of offers that they refused to consider. There are good reasons for this. They have a lot of political problems internally that are hard to solve. But um, I don't expect Palestinians to embrace the book. I'm very anti-BDS. I think it's a catastrophe for the Palestinians. Um, but, um, but what I hope is that the book has well over a thousand sources. I haven't quoted them, but I don't, I don't give you, I give all the evidence for my argument. So I hope that the book will, um, will help people firm up their understanding, if not necessarily change their mind. It's very hard to change minds, but there's something else I care about. For 95% of the book, I feel I wrote it as a historian rather than as a liberal American Jew, which I also am. But then at the end, I say that American Jews, American Jewishness, Jewishness is in crisis now. Again, not, not the Orthodox, but conservative Jewry has lost a third of its members in a very short period of time. Reformed Jewry has lost almost as many. Uh, These are various uh, liberal Jewish denominations. Yeah, well, secular. Sec yeah, yeah, more secular. Say, yeah. um, and, they're, and, and young Jews are really alienated from Israel. They don't look at the Holocaust the way my generation did as something that happened to their families. And the they're being told they have to be Jewish because of anti-Semitism. And the same argument, support Israel, remember the Holocaust. And it's just not working anymore. And I feel that American Judaism has, has been overly reliant on this this experience of people who live in a very different society 5,000 miles away that is inconsistent with their own lives. And also the story they've been told is not true. And no wonder they're not interested. And I would like to see 
growing out of this disillusionment with Israel, a new commitment on the part of American Judaism to reimagine itself so that it can move into the next century. For me, I've done it through scholarship. My my Jewish identity, which was not that strong. I mean, I, w- I always knew I was a Jew and I cared that I was a Jew, but I didn't really like being a Jew until I, I learned about rabbinical literature in my 30s. And then I went to graduate school and I minored in Jewish studies. And it's a whole world that was opened up to me that has become the most exciting and interesting thing in my life ever since for the past 20 years, at least. Um, not everyone's going to be excited by scholarship. You know, I went to Torah study for 15 years every morning without going to shul. Um, but I, I think there's a whole incredible richness to the Jewish tradition and culture uh, that has has been hidden by the intense focus on Zionism and, and on the Holocaust. And I, I'd like to see an opening up and a reimagination and some commitment of resources to, to, to rethinking what it means to be a diaspora Jew in the future. So that's my, that's my hope. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share your thoughts with us today. Thank you. I enjoyed it. That concludes our program. Thanks for listening and have a great day.